I wanted to thank the University of Michigan for the opportunity to share our work with, with all of you. Um, as uh, was said, I spend a lot of time educating a lot of different audiences, particularly in the corporate community, um, about the needed, urgent response to climate change. But the work that you're all doing here at the very local level to try to get people more aware about the issue is really, really critical. And I just want to thank you all, and I think you should all give yourselves a round of applause um, for, for everything that you're doing to, to promote the Climate Savers Computing Initiative here at Michigan. Um, we launched the computing initiative about a year ago um, with Google and Intel. And in that time, we brought on uh, hundreds of partners throughout the sector. And it's an extension of a large body of work that we've been trying to, to do to promote um, climate action in the, in the corporate community. We now have 18 partners in our classic Climate Savers program and then um, a number of actors in this IT-related initiative. But before we get into those details, um, I wanted to share with you um, a few things that, that take us back to the mission. You know, World Wildlife Fund's primary interest is to preserve or build upon 40 years of conservation work. And we can't be a responsible actor in conservation without taking on the very important challenge of climate change. That 40 years of conservation will be for naught if we don't work on this big challenge of global warming. So with that in mind, um, this is a photo that I took in the Arctic um, a year ago, last October. Or sorry, uh, two years ago, last October. Um, take yourselves out of what would be cold Ann Arbor to an even colder place. This is the polar bear capital of the world in Churchill, Manitoba. I'm in a tundra buggy looking down at this poor guy um, in four degree temperatures, four feet of snow on the ground, uh, howling winds, um, not far from this guy who's probably pretty hungry. Um, so this was literally right, right below the buggy. Um, we had a chance to, to get out on the tundra, on these tundra buggies through um, great white bear tours. Um, they take groups of, of uh, members and researchers uh, and photographers out to the Tundra Lodge, which is um, it's basically a, a series of uh, modular homes uh, connected to one another on top of tractor tires. But yeah, it, it's, it's an amazing place, and you're literally in the middle of bear habitat. You're on the edge of Hudson Bay. This is, this is the leading edge of where the bears um, get on this skateboard, which is ice that's flowing um, through the headwaters of this river and into Hudson Bay, which they ride out to get out to seals, which are their, their primary food source. And you can see all this from the Tundra Lodge. The bears come up to the lodge. They're very curious animals. Um, they have an opportunity to kind of check things out. There's a cook on board the lodge. Um, believe it or not, he used to work with um, Chef Gordon Ramsay uh, in London from Hell's Kitchen. And he's got all kinds of stories about working with, with Ramsay and um, getting punched out for overcooking lobster ravioli. But <laughs> beyond that, um, it's a wonderful place um, to spend a few days. A little bit isolated, but you can see the northern lights, and you, you're literally in the middle of bear habitat. The bears will come up, sniff around, um, check out the bottom of your boots. Um, it's really a phenomenal place to see uh, the bears in, in the wild. Oops. But it's also an interesting place to see what, what the impacts of global warming are having on, on this species, which is at the top of the food chain. Uh, many of the bears are underweight. Um, they're at a point where uh, they're, they're not able to birth as many cubs because um, they're not able to get out and get as much food as they were able to. This is a picture from last year. Same week, same time of year. Last year was a very um, strange year in the Arctic. We had some of the lowest sea ice on record. Summer temperatures when we went on this trip. Um, 60, 70 degrees, same week in October. A um, lot fewer bears. And they were, a lot of the bears were congregating in Churchill, but couldn't get out on any ice because there wasn't any ice, and feeding on garbage in the garbage dump. 
And this, this is the consequence of climate change. I mean, here's a bear that's obviously very hungry, <laughs> and there's nothing to eat because he can't get out um, on that sea ice. So what is the status of the polar bear? And, and this is really the canary in the coal mine for climate change. There's no question about it. These guys are at the top of the food chain. Um, they are one of the biggest indicator species, which is why we use it as our signature species for the program. There's about 25,000 polar bears in the world. They're distributed um, in 19 subpopulations of 100 to 3,000 bears each. And in western Hudson Bay, where those pictures were taken, Numbers have declined from about 1,200 bears in 1987 to um, around 800 in, in 2008. The Beaufort Sea in northern Alaska has a population that's dropped 15% um, in the last five years, from 1,800 to 1,500 bears. Only the populations in the Nunavut area of Canada are, are stable. Um, and in May of 2006, the International Union of, of Conservation networks added the polar bear to the red list. So there were a lot of headlines over the course of the last couple years on polar bears. Um, if, if warming increases, two-thirds of, of polar bears will disappear by mid-century. Um, Dr. Amstrup, who's been studying polar bears for a long time, has said that an abrupt collapse could, abrupt collapse could occur. Um, the bears are stuck on land. Um, they're short on food or they're out on these ice flows drifting over the depths of the Arctic. And we saw pictures that NOAA had from helicopters this summer of bears swimming completely lost at sea. Um, sea ice during the, the 07 melt season plummeted to the, the lowest levels um, since satellite measurement. And average sea ice for uh, September was the lowest on record, shattering 05 records by 23%. So there's clearly something dramatic going on, at the, on in the Arctic. And and people need to be aware of this. I mean, even the US Navy has said that the Arctic Ocean will be nothing but blue by, by 2013. So WWF is the world's largest conservation organization. Our main mission is to stop the degradation of the planet's natural environment and to build a future in which humans live in harmony with nature. Conserve biodiversity, ensure the use of natural um, resources that are renewable, and sustainable and promote the reduction of pollution and wasteful consumption. The global goal is by 2015, we want to conserve 19 of the world's most important natural places. Uh, we're going to achieve this by focusing on solutions that are global in scope uh, and scale and use our trusted brand, which is very well recognized, to emotionally connect with people um, and that in, a, in a credible way in the marketplace. And our expertise is mainly in energy and in water and in commodities. Our, our brand has had an evolution over the years. Um, in 1961, it was uh, uh, just a, a, mere, a mere panda, but it has uh, evolved in that time. Um, this is an organization that was started by politicians, economists, scientists, who felt that there wasn't a global voice for conservation. And it was um, founded in Switzerland. We operate on a global scale, um, founded in 1961, uh, about $3.7 billion raised worldwide in the last 10 years. We've got 5 million members, about 1.2 million in the US, uh, and about 4,000 staff, including 250 PhDs. And in 46 years, we've undertaken about 13,000 projects in 157 countries. So it's, uh, it's a major undertaking. We've got offices in just about every country. It's, it's a wonderful network where I can pick up the phone on any given day, talk to one of my colleagues in another country, compare notes, see what strategies they're using, and use that to uh, further our mission in the US. So to summarize, um, we're the largest leading independent conservation organization, big global network, offices in over 50 countries, lots of projects, <laughs> science-based, results-oriented, and a proven track record of over 40 years. And we have one of the most recognized logos on the planet. Oops. So why, does, why is that logo important? Well, for me, it gets me in the doors of lots of corporations around the world that I wouldn't normally be able to, to walk into. 
because we rank among the top 10 most trusted brands by the Edelman Trust and Brand Credibility Survey. We're right up there with Johnson & Johnson, with Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Ford, um, and the others that rank on that survey are groups like Amnesty and Greenpeace, but are a bit lower than WWF. So we focus on species, on spaces like the Amazon, Oops. on deforestation, um, tropical logging, just to give you a bit of a flavor for some of the other work that we do. Um, on agriculture and the sustainable practice behind agriculture, fisheries, and also on the money flows. We're doing a lot of work on connecting Wall Street with conservation, trying to figure out where the money flows. Is shareholder value being affected by companies that are more responsible in the conservation realm? For example, um, we've been looking at these climate saver companies and whether or not their shareholder value is enhanced by the fact that they have a, a cleaner energy perspective, have worked more to lower the carbon footprint of their company. And with many power companies to get them to adopt more forms of renewable energy. To frame climate change, I just wanted to uh, pick up on a quote from John Holdren at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, he spoke at an event uh, where we participated at the Investor Summit on Climate Risk at the UN, and I thought that he did a really good job of framing the issue. The problem of the, of the disruption of global climate uh, by human-produced greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is coming to be understood as the most dangerous and intractable of all environmental problems caused by human activity. And it's intractable because the dominant cause of this, the disruption is the emission of greenhouse gases that currently produce 80% of civilization's energy. So why is that important? Well, it, because if our energy system is gonna look any different than it does now, we need to get moving. I mean, we're running out of time. So we know what the problem is. The greenhouse effect, you've all heard the story. Um, solar radiation is passing through the atmosphere, but it has nowhere to go. Um, there's so much buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere that it's trapping a lot of that heat. So that's why we see more pronounced heat waves, uh, more uh, pronounced storm activity, et cetera. There's a, another piece of evidence that um, Many have seen, particularly uh, in the Gore film, if you saw an Inconvenient Truth, uh, this is referred to as the hockey stick graph. Um, but it really shows that the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere track one to one with, with temperature. Um, so as we see levels of CO2 go up, uh, close to 400 parts per million, we're seeing a dramatic increase in temperature as well. This is essentially what Landsat satellites took photos of, of the um, Arctic sea ice in the late 70s, and this is what it looked like at that point in time. Um, that is what it looked like in 2003. So there's no question that we're seeing a dramatic decline in the mass of sea ice in the Arctic North. Um, these have been fast and severe changes, and, and, and actually scientists are in a bit of a panic because it's happening a lot faster than we expected. And as many in the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment said, the Arctic is extremely vulnerable and it's now experiencing some of the most rapid and severe climate change on Earth. That is the September extent of sea ice that we currently see, more or less. This could be what it looks like in 2040 to 2060, 2070. Um, and then we, we switch gears here for a second. So what do we do about the problem? I mean, that this, this, this is not a gloom and doom story. I'm not here to um, make people go home and <laughs> completely lose hope. Um, I'm actually very, very optimistic about how we can solve this problem. And I'm optimistic because I'm looking at a lot of the data and I'm looking at the statistics and I'm looking at this last election and I'm seeing how the American public is becoming more aware about this. 80% of Americans believe that climate change is a result of human action. Three quarters of Americans believe that the U.S. should reduce its emissions and support policies that reduce emissions. There's not a clear sense of urgency and, cons and, and there's concern about the cost of action, of action, but the majority of people support a cost. Um, climate action is lowest among conservatives uh, and wealthier Americans. Support for climate action is generally weaker among some groups. And 74% of Americans would 
support regs that would require all homes to be energy efficient. Polling results right now are roughly the same as what they've been in Canada and in Europe. So we're, we're right there with the rest of the world. So you're going to see a lot more of this from the new administration. And why is that? Well, the US is key. Per capita, we use almost twice as much energy as any other part of the world. So each person. Um, and then if you look at this on a state by state level, it's quite staggering. Texas, um, as you can see, is using um, you know, quite a bit more energy than Australia or Canada. Um, and this is per capita emissions, per person for these states compared to many countries. Um, almost three times as much as the average German citizen. And probably four to five times as much as the, as, as the average Mexican. <laughs> so it's really dramatic, the, the extent to which people need to change behavior in the US. What I do is try to mobilize the business community to take action on this issue. And so business has a very special relationship with, with climate change, much more so than governments and a lot of other institutions. Businesses control the stocks, the flows, uh, the feedback loops that determine the emissions of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And different businesses are affected and can affect climate change in different ways. They need assistance in figuring out how to best operate in this environment of total uncertainty. This is a new issue to them, and they really need help. So we come with a toolbox of different tools to help them out. And there's a lot of specific ways we can help. So they're looking at data, too. They see there's a lot of indicators of the dawn of a new era. Um, polling data points to extreme weather incident it's changing opinions in the United States. We had Hurricane Katrina. It was a dramatic event for this country. The majority now believe climate change is real and it's dangerous, and storms are increasing in intensity. Oops. We had an inconvenient truth. Um, the most seen documentary in history, um, seen by a significant percentage of opinion leaders, um, it brought the scientific ev evidence to, into clear view for people. Seeing was believing. Uh, the extent and speed of, of, of warming uh, had a lasting impression on people. And then there was the Stern Review. For all you economists in the room, you're probably grinning with glee, but the Stern Review really brought this into a place where economists could make sense of it all. It said that the study, um, or the study concluded that inaction could result in a significant economic slowdown. Um, act fast or pay the costs, and they're high costs. Stabilizing CO2 is going to cost 1% of world economic product if we do it now. If we don't act, it's going to require 5 to 20% of world economic product over the next few years. And more and more economic capacity is going to be spent cleaning up after the mess uh, or helping people find food. And then we had, and these are all sort of different things that have happened over the course of the last 18 months that have helped um, drive the problem uh, into people's circle of awareness. The Princeton Mitigation Institute has divided this problem into seven wedges of technology that we could deploy to get to carbon free by 2050. So these are all kinds of things that we have right now that we could use to completely zero our carbon emissions. Everything from energy efficiency to wind to solar to geothermal, uh, hydro, and nuclear. It says that we need seven tons of gigaton of seven gigatons of carbon reductions every year for the next 50 years. Um, how much is a gigaton? Well, it's basically like doubling the fuel efficiency of two billion cars. Um, and if we deployed those seven wedges of technology, we'd basically stabilize emissions in the atmosphere. So when we work with companies, we kind of take them through a hierarchy of the three R's of corporate climate responsibility. And the first one is risk. Is your business threatened um, by climate change at a fundamental level? Are your, are your facilities going to be affected by sea level rise? You know, that, that's an easy thing to identify early. So they basically do a long-term and a short-term risk profile. Um, and investors increasingly want to see this kind of risk analysis because the, the vulnerability to climate impacts are, are here. The next phase is a reward. So GE launched their Ecoimagination program. British Petroleum has their Beyond Petroleum program. They saw 
an enormous business opportunity. They saw the climate change was coming and they realized that there was a tremendous change in the way that they could think about energy materials, transport, and communications. So they're getting a significant return on investment by focusing their marketing on the kind of contribution that they could make to a climate-friendly world. And then there's this next level of hierarchy, which is responsibility. So companies need to take greater and greater responsibility for the issue for, because it's an ethical imperative. The companies that are taking more responsibility are going to be seen as part of the transformation, and the companies that don't are going to be the outliers. And it's dawning on the world that, real, that there's really um, great power in making a difference on this issue. So companies join Climate Savers. They sign the Bali Communique. They're listed in the Climate Count Survey. There's all kinds of things that they can do um, now that there's these new ethical demands on companies. So yes, business is the key to solving the problem. Um, climate change is caused by most of the processes that business are, are involved in. Uh, they have a stark choice. They take a responsibility now. They make a transformation to a low carbon account, economy or they take responsibility later and face the consequences. And there are going to be significant consequences with that. So a little bit of food for thought. Addressing climate change is a big investment for companies. Uh, the more companies engage, the greater return on their investment. Climate Savers helps companies invest uh, by reducing climate change risks, finding climate change related rewards, and asserting that climate change, that companies can take responsibility. So we lead them to a place where they have a guiding ethic and a business plan. We've got 18 partners in the program, many companies that you recognize, consumer-facing names like HP, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, Nike, um, Allianz, uh, Sony. So these are the classic companies that have set really groundbreaking goals to reduce their carbon emissions. Catalyst Paper has set a 70% reduction target against a 2000 baseline. So it's a dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, basically phasing out fossil fuel and using some of the waste wood in their process to feed their uh, pulp and paper plants. So we've had a lot of allies along the way. Senator Kerry was a big supporter. Um, he helped launch the program in the year 2000 at a press conference in Boston where he said, innovative initiatives such as Climate Savers are playing a critical role in helping us understand the powerful unity between business, the environment, and business creativity. And it's been helpful to have leaders like that uh, support us along the way. We've kind of been on a mission to cut CO2 since 1999, and we've mobilized dozens of uh, multinational companies to take action, dispelled the myth that the costs are too high, uh, showed that real cuts can add up. These companies are now contributing over 14,000 tons of emissions reductions every year. That's like taking four and a half million cars off the road every year. Um, and we've demonstrated a lot of really neat ways to reduce energy consumption, deploy clean energy technology, and help companies sh shape low carbon business plans. We've also done a lot of fun things along the way. This is an ad from last May uh, the Business of Green section of the New York Times. Um, it's a polar bear in the grocery store, or, or a polar bear in a freezer at the grocery store. In the ice cream freezer, actually. Uh, it says, what happens when there's nowhere left to go? Now, I didn't think for a moment that the companies would uh, support such an edgy ad. But they went nuts for it. They covered the cost of the creative. They covered the cost of the placement. They were really... Uh, very, very uh, behind this endeavor that we took. And it was the first time that we really tried to do anything significant on a national scale to, to promote the program. Um, the subtext says, the debate on global warming is over. The scientific evidence is irrefutable. Now is the time for partnership and action. And we've actually gotten dozens of inquiries as a result of this ad. Um, so it does show that the power of marketing is still a good tool to be used. So how do we scale this up? We can't do it alone. In a lot of ways, we're, we're doing the work that EPA fails to do um, in the absence of regulation at the federal level. But if half of the Fortune 500 companies reduce their emissions by just 5%, they'd stop spewing as much carbon every year as can be absorbed by 94 million acres of trees. 5%, not a huge target. If just 100 companies lowered their emissions by 5%, 
It'd be the equivalent of taking 25 million cars off the road for a year. I'm going to shift over a little bit and focus on the computing initiative because that's something that uh, Michigan has uh, embraced wholeheartedly. And we, uh, again, thank you for the, the support. Um, this was a really neat thing that, that Google and Intel brought to us, and it was a way to extend the brand into a whole new realm um, in the IT sector. And what it is, is it's a growing group of uh, nonprofits, uh, NGOs, corporations, governments, universities, over 3,000 individual entities that have focused on the energy efficiency of computers. And the objective is to reduce electricity consumption from the uh, operation of computers. So by 2010, uh, the increases in hardware efficiency and changes in user behavior could reduce emissions by 54 million tons annually. That's like five times what the group of climate saver companies is doing. So we said, heck yeah. Um, <laughs> to remain focused, um, there's two target areas for, for conservation. Power efficient hardware, as you know, um, buying more efficient computing technology, and then user behavior, educating people to use power management to increase um, power management functionality. Why energy efficiency of computers? Well, um, we recognize that wasted electricity from the use of computers contributes to increased power costs and CO2 emissions. Um, the CSCI companies, as, a, as makers of the equipment, account for more than 60% of global PCs and, and servers that are sold. And, and we have many of the largest users of IT involved, um, like many universities. So this Google experiment, if you will, which uh, was brought to us by two Michigan grads, um, and was enabled by WWF. We brought our brand credibility uh, to the initiative. And um, it's really kind of a holistic cost structure approach for, for data center operations. Um, there's a significant return on investment if you store more and more uh, in fewer servers, and Google and HP are particularly good in optimizing that. And we recognize that the uh, environmental benefits could be profound. So there was one goal was to accelerate industry transformation um, for hardware power conversion to higher efficiency components. So the electricity used in a typical computer today, um, about half of the electricity is wasted. And our goal is that by 2010, um, you know, roughly uh, you know, one, less than one quarter of that will be uh, waste. Um, so we're, we're working on the supply side, and we're also working on the demand side. So we work with the makers of the computers, recruit manufacturers, um, and we also raise awareness for power efficiency among all kinds of consumers uh, at retail locations. There's a sort of three-step process to educating um, users, which I think you've enabled, um, education and outreach campaigns, but also helping people with tools, with resources, and support, sharing best practices, publishing white papers, uh, and then engaging and mobilizing members to, to reach out to different segments. So we've been at the trade shows with the companies. We've been um, at Best Buy, uh, really kind of trying to get the word out that this is a huge way for people to contribute to solving global warming. Why is the model interesting? And this, this is the part that really is fascinating to me. Um, as our friends at Google have said, a rising tide lifts all boats. And it, they borrowed that from <laughs> former President Kennedy. Um, but Climate Savers Computing is, is rooted in the belief that our collective impact is far greater than what we can accomplish as organizations. Um, a company's image and brand value is tied inextricably to its specific industry sectors. Having leaders of an industry collaborate like this together with the support from conservation and, and government organizations on issues of sustainability is good for everybody, and we've proven that. Every industry um, has analogous opportunities to the Climate Savers Computing Initiative. So now we're thinking about the Climate Savers Steel Initiative and the Climate Savers Chemicals Initiative and the Climate Savers Concrete Initiative. So we're going to uh, test this in a lot of other kinds of sectors as well. How is Michigan is participating? Well, 
Um, it's good for the university bottom line because you pay less in electricity the more you get people that get smart about energy. Um, he started by adopting a policy to have uh, people enable the power management settings um, and having your procurement pro team hopefully specify high efficiency computers in the future. These two steps are going to reduce wasted energy uh, in exponential ways. And finally, Michigan joined the, the Climate Saver Smart Computing Initiative, and it's important to have this, dis, this support to move from inefficient, wasteful computing to sustainable, energy efficient computing. We are embarking on a second year of a major campaign in March that a lot of universities, cities, companies will be involved in called Earth Hour. It's at 8 o'clock on March 29, 2008 which encourages the entire world to power down for an hour. It starts in Christchurch, New Zealand, and works its way around the planet. And this year, the focal cities are going to be New York, Los Angeles, Nashville, uh, and there are cities signing on every day. Uh, last year, just a quick anecdote, I was in Chicago. And they uh, put me in the theater district to um, interface with media as they came down to see what's happening with Earth Hour. And uh, we exceeded our limit again here. Um, <laughs> at 8 o'clock, Chicago powered down. The, the witch from the Broadway show Wicked came out and cast a spell across the theater district. And the whole theater district went dark. So there were tons of really um, innovative and creative events going on all around the world for Earth Hour. Um, and it was really impressive to see. As you looked at the Chicago skyline, the only thing you could see on were the, the aviation lights on the top of the Sears Tower. And there was a 17% energy uh, decrease um, compared to the same day last year, which is, is significant. It was actually one, of, Chicago was one of the best participating cities uh, in the whole world. And so I would encourage uh, Michigan to, th to consider um, an Earth Hour uh, campaign this year. So 50 million people participated. It was absolutely incredible. 100 US cities were part of the mix. Major icons went dark. The Golden Gate Bridge, the Sears Tower, the Empire State Building, um, US Airways Arena, CNN headquarters, major media pickup, 6.2 million unique visitors to the, to the Earth Hour website, uh, coverage by over 2,100 television stations. 500 to a billion people were exposed to news coverage on Earth Hour. So it's, it's become a huge event. And this year, it's going to be very focused and from a messaging standpoint on trying to get people oriented toward getting governments to pass a global climate policy uh, that gets us on a track to dramatically reduce emissions. And you're going to have to. Um, for the first time ever, Coca Cola hosted some Earth Hour messaging in Times Square on their sign, um, which was. Uh, a huge help, um, and then Times Square went dark. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which companies have been able to participate. Um, there were also a number of funny ads from around the network. This one is from Poland. Uh, and they're getting a little racy on uh, climate change. Um, this one says, if you're going to have fun, turn out the light. Um, <laughs> Uh, th this is actually a, a great campaign that's in the, in the fashion magazines in Europe. Um, this one is in Germany. Uh, it, it says climate change is here. If you don't ignore it, it won't go away. Uh, this was in, in European Vogue. Um, this is an ad from Russia. And I believe it says... Uh, ice is melting, but not just in your drink or something along those lines. And then our friends in the UK get very creative. Um, this is a, an ad from, uh, from London. Um, it's a polar bear in dire straits in, in a uh, shanty town. <laughs> so I always like to kind of wrap things up with five things you can take home with you uh, that you can do to lower your carbon footprint, um, get your friends to do. Uh, that really empowers people to take action on global warming. Because if there's been anything that's been missing over the course of the last couple of years in a lot of this messaging about global warming, it's stuff that gets people to do things. And there's really five quick and easy things that you can do to lower your, your, your impact or, be, or live a more climate-friendly lifestyle. 
And I would say first and foremost is support clean energy. Um, wind and solar is here. It's affordable. Um, there's sometimes a price premium, but there's always a green pi pricing program at your local utility. So ask your utility about their green power program. Drive a smart vehicle or don't drive. <laughs> Walk, bike, take mass transit. Um, I think we're seeing a shift to that because of the, the rising energy prices. Um, but there's a lot better choices out there in terms of fuel efficient vehicles. You know that. Um, and that's one of the areas in which emissions growth has really expanded in the United States over the, the last 10 years. Conserve electricity, uh, improve the energy efficiency of your home. There's all kinds of things that, that you can get at Home Depot these days. Uh, compact flu fluorescent lights, uh, energy efficient windows, energy efficient Energy Star appliances. Um, really good technology that's come a long way. Uh, in California and Australia, they're probably going to phase out the incandescent light, uh, which, which makes sense. These new light bulbs are 10 times more efficient, and we're going to see another generation of lighting come out this year, which are LEDs. Support campaigns. Um, educate others. Write to leaders. Urge them to support higher fuel efficiency standards, uh, clean energy, mandatory caps on greenhouse gas emissions. I think there's been a shift in public consciousness around this issue. A lot of elected officials are speaking more uh, with authority on the issue of climate change and the kinds of things that can be done in the near term to reduce our carbon footprint. Last but not least, um, after you've conquered all the other things that you can do to lower your carbon footprint, consider offsetting your, your travel. Um, we have spun off a offset standards organization called the Gold Standard. So this is a quality rating for offsets, quality offsets, um, that can help you reduce your emissions from, from flying. And so if you're going to offset your flights, make sure they're Gold Standard certified offsets. Um, but those are really the five things that you can do. And if you run into a skeptic and you really need a sound bite that's going to blow them away, remind them that atmospheric CO2 is higher than any time in the last 650,000 years. I mean, there's a lot of people um, that are still on the fringe of this issue kind of scratching their head thinking, well, you know, we've gone through a lot of cycles. This planet um, has gone through many phases of geologic uh, distress here and there. Temperatures have ebbed and flowed. Um, but the science says, again, there's never been so much carbon in the atmosphere uh, in the last 650,000 years. So I'm going to wrap it up there. I was really hoping to open this up as a conversation um, so that we could take a, a, some Q&A uh, to kind of discuss some of these issues a little bit further. Uh, and just want to thank everybody for their time. and. Uh, I encourage you to, to join WWF um, and support the climate change program. Thank you very much. You mentioned the uh, sort of uh, hope, optimism about corporate responsibility relative to climate change. And, but it, it, what, you, what you talked about was setting goals. Uh, I, I worry a little bit about the economists called cheap talk. Sort of says someday, yes, we you know we, we we will accomplish this, especially in this age of uh, real economic crises where right. companies are, are in fact worried about making it tomorrow, let alone long run. Uh, is there good evidence that companies are really doing things besides setting goals? Some of the companies you mentioned. Yeah, and I and I think that the reason that they're setting audacious goals is not just because of the ethical imperative of climate change, but also because of the cost savings. IBM has saved over $850 million since they joined Climate Savers just working on energy efficiency alone. So there's a huge business case to be made for this. Um, is that the right motivator? It's hard, hard to say. Um, but in, in 
capitalistic terms, it seems to work. Um, and so uh, Johnson & Johnson is another perfect example. They've saved, on average, about $40 million a year. And they've taken that savings and they've invested in solar. And they're now the largest commercial generator of solar powered. Um, they have the largest commercial solar installation, or one of the largest commercial solar installations on their Neutrogena plant in Los Angeles. I think what's frustrating from a programmatic management perspective is the companies are still hesitant to talk about this. Uh, they are still dragging their feet um, and not promoting what they're doing uh, in a proactive way. And, and that is tricky because you see a lot of companies taking advantage of the marketing, doing the Beyond Petroleum thing, the eco-imagination uh, type campaigns. And meanwhile, these other guys who are doing quite a bit more are still a little bit skittish about this because they see it as a politically charged issue that's a bit of a hot potato. And hopefully we'll see that change over the next few months um, with a, a shift in the political direction of the, comp of the country. Um, but uh, I just wish that the, the companies would be, get a little bit more comfortable with amplifying what they do. Uh, Matt, one of the issues that comes up when we when we're doing stuff is it seems like every company, particularly in the IT space, does sort of have sort of a green position. Right. And it's hard to tell who's being real and who's just sort of marketing it. And I was wondering if you could just comment, uh, you know, how you know WWF might help us or just how we might sort of navigate, make sure we're actually using the vendors that are the right ones to use. Sure. Well, in the IT space, I think um, you know the best thing to do is to go to the Climate Savers Computing Initiative website, where there's a catalog where you can look at um, how many uh, units each company has deployed in terms of energy efficient uh, computing technology. Um, we do a lot of due diligence around these companies whenever we form a partnership. So we're grinding through their annual reports. We're looking at their their um, uh, 10K filings, all kinds of things to see what their environmental liabilities are. And we're very scrupulous about the kind of companies that we work with um, to make sure that there are not any things that we can't live with because we can't put that, that brand next to a company that we don't necessarily um, share the same values with. Um, so that, I think that's um, one thing that, that is really challenging for an environmental group of our size. So I was wondering if you could share some insights on the per capita. It was pretty striking, the differences between U.S. and the other countries. Yeah. Sure. I, I, yeah. Um, we drive longer distances. We heat our homes with heavy fuel oil uh, and uh, natural gas. Um, uh, there are a lot of things in our um, lifestyle as consumers that are very energy intensive. Um, the, our built environment um, requires a lot of driving. Um, it's a very different lifestyle from that that we see in other parts of the world. I had the benefit of living in Sweden for three years. And it's a, it's a much more modest lifestyle um, with a lot more Walking, biking, public transit is excellent. Uh, you can take the train at, at just about everywhere, and you don't need a car. Um, if you notice, the Canadians were also quite high, and, and it's a similar situation where they're driving longer distances and needing more and more energy to heat, heat space. So that's, that's really um, the challenge is living in the northern hemisphere. How do we use energy more efficiently and heat more efficiently? And, and I think Scandinavia is a great place to, to use as a model because they do a lot more district heating. Um, they pipe heating to cover entire towns or entire neighborhoods from one source as opposed to lots of little sources. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that we can do on a per capita stand, uh, level to reduce our carbon footprint. I had a question about um, some of the businesses that you talked about. Um, it sounds like the Climate Savers Program has had a great success of a lot of corporations. Some of those corporations that are still having doubts about buying into the program, what are some of those most common reasons and then how do you counteract and get people to buy in and show them how we can really make, make things very energy efficient and can save you know, carbon emissions and money for those businesses as well? 
It's a good question. It, I guess it's less of a question of buy-in and more a question of whether the companies have the resources that are required to do a total footprint analysis. I mean, I think that that's the, the thing that companies would struggle with the most is if you don't hire a team of people to really tackle this issue head on, uh, you, you can't really expect that you're going to make progress on, on the climate change issue. And what I mean by that is um, you've got to have dedicated staff people that are willing to go through every facility, do an energy audit, look at energy efficiency, um, really come up with a comprehensive plan on how to optimize all these things within the corporate structure. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're swimming upstream. Um, even the companies that we work with are com incredibly under-resourced. We do a lot of work with Coca-Cola. Um, and lots of other uh, large entities like Hewlett Packard, where they've got one guy who's working um, on the company's total footprint analysis. And that's not enough. <laughs> I mean, this, this is a huge undertaking. And, and co if companies are smart, they'll figure out a way to, to staff it up and pay for more people with the savings that they're finding from energy efficiency. So I can see what the, can you hear me? I don't want to. Yep, I can sure. see what the incentive would be for a company that would see the results of savings immediately through energy savings, but for a company that wouldn't profit from uh, saving costs in energy, but would rather have a long-term view of profiting from less negative effects from climate change, how do you, you said that they're going to see results the more companies that participate. Do they ever ask you about com uh, companies that aren't U.S. or European-based? Are there concerns at all about the fact that maybe China or India or other countries really aren't doing anything? So even if they invest money, it's not really going to have effect overall because it's such a huge global problem. I would say quite the opposite. The reason that the U.S. companies have mobilized in, in this program are because they operate in a global world where their, their, their companies are regulated in Kyoto-compliant um, countries. And so they don't want to fall behind. And, and there's an incentive for them to act by joining a voluntary program like Climate Savers because they're, they're getting es essentially what they want under the regulatory framework, which is early action credit. And nobody knows what that's going to look like when the rules get written, but they are eager to show that they're taking a responsible lead on this issue in the same way the German companies are, the Japanese companies are, um, that the Nordic companies are, uh, because they see this as you know the right thing to do. Um, it, it, it also there are also business benefits, but you know a healthcare company like Johnson and Johnson really thinks that this is better for people and better for the planet. Um, so I think that they're they're motivated by a variety of things, and there's a lot of international pressure, and and those com these companies are feeling it. And what's troubling is that companies now, after working on this for 10 years, are far ahead of governmental institutions. So governments are playing catch up, and meanwhile, the companies are filing more and more letters on Capitol Hill to senators and to members of Congress saying, what's, what's the holdup? Well, you know, what, we're, we've made this progress, and we don't have the certainty we need to plan for future business horizons. I see a follow-up coming. <laughs> so do you think there is political support now uh, necessary to maybe pass some regulations in this area? Both candidates in the presidential election made commitments that uh, they will um, sign a cap-and-trade policy that caps emissions and trades the allowances within two years of uh, taking office. So I, I think we will see significant action um, from this administration. Um, will it be tempered by this economic headwind that we're feeling right now? Well, maybe. But um, at the same time, uh, the science is ever more prominent that, that this problem is kind of a, a train that's um, out of control. Uh, and we, we've got to slow down this, this curve in emissions. I mean, it just since 1990, the emissions in the U.S. are, are up 20 percent. So um, there's a lot of work to do. Kind of building off her question, um, with the new administration now coming in uh, next year, 
can you expand upon what other areas um, the Obama administration, if, I mean, talks might still be early on, but what right. you think will be improved, though, in the next four years compared to what has been done in the past? Well, so far they've talked about um, an infusion of uh, incentives and um, uh, programs for clean energy um, to uh, expand the use of renewable power sources, and I think that that's, that's right on. There are some incentives that are already in place that the Congress passed in the last energy bill, which have been helpful, the wind energy production tax credit, but that's, that's not enough. Um, uh, Senator and now President-elect Obama has talked about um, a large incentive package. Um, there will also be incentives for energy efficiency and for the um, energy efficiency of homes and buildings. Um, buildings are a major part of our uh, carbon footprint as a, as a nation, and there's a lot of things that can be done there. And there have been some really good things that the U.S. Green Building Council has been doing to create standards, to create a hierarchy of gold, platinum, bronze ratings for buildings. Um, but that needs to be adopted by the EPA. I mean, there's, there's just a lot of things that the EPA could have been doing over the last eight years um, that it has just been incredibly neglectful of this problem. But yes, I think there's going to be a suite of different things that, uh, that this administration does. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we created a, WWF created a green print for the kinds of things that uh, the administration um, should adopt, and you can find that on our website at um, www.us.org. Yes, I think we're all very excited about the transitions that we hope are occurring. And thank you for, for guiding us through those, Matt. Yeah. <laughs>